Welcome to Value Added, the real estate podcast where we speak with the brightest minds in the world of real estate who provide, create, and realize value in an ever-changing market. If you're a real estate professional delivering value to your clients, an investor creating value not seen by others, or a busy professional who passively invests in real estate to grow the value of their hard-earned dollar, then you're in the right place. And now your host, Nick Walters. Hey gang, welcome to another episode of Value Added, the real estate podcast. On this week's episode, we're chatting with Drew Whitson. Drew is a Minneapolis, Minnesota-based investor. He's got approximately 2,200 multifamily units under his control. He's also an educator and a mentor. He is an advisor with Michael Blanc's Dealmaker Mastermind Group. And we welcome to the show today. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. Yeah, let's get rolling here, Drew. Um, yeah. we're, we're live, so... Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and and uh, and joining me for uh, for a little chat. Great, happy to be here. Thanks, Nick. So uh, you've got a you've got a pretty uh, a pretty extensive background or a a, a story. Um, I mean, you're you're a real estate investor, syndicator. Uh, you're you're an an advisor and educator with uh, Michael Blanc's Dealmaker Mastermind. Uh, you're you're a finance professor. Kind of tell tell our listeners a little bit more about your your. Uh, your work experience and what led you up to this point? Sure. My, uh, my first job out of undergraduate school was working for an investment bank that syndicated public and private real estate funds. So that was kind of my first exposure to the real estate market. I finished up getting my MBA at University of Minnesota's school and went to work for Target Corporation uh, as a, in their finance department. So I spent almost a decade at Target sort of bouncing around their different corporate financial roles. Um, but while I was running my time at Target, I was also building up a real estate portfolio. Back in 2008, 2009, 2010, I was buying up single family homes in the crash. I was picking up houses across the street. I bought houses down the street. And so I, I sort of find, found an opportunity to buy single family homes in my neighborhood. But then as that and as the, the value recovered, I was able to access some of that equity and then get into the multifamily space starting with you know, three plexes, four plexes. I did a lot of joint venture deals here in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area. Uh, and as I sort of expanded that experience, I ended up being able to learn how to use my in investor's dollars um, through legal means called you know, syndication. And I picked up uh, quite a bit of assets across the country, primarily in sort of the Mid-South, and I think of the Memphis, Little Rock, Huntsville area. Uh, and so today I'm a managing member of about 2,200 units. Uh, I've been able to quit my corporate job several years ago and just per, per, uh, pursue real estate full time. Um, and because I am a real estate investor, I don't have a job in real estate. I'm just an investor of real estate. Uh, that means I'm able to use my time in ways that I think are both valuable and interesting to me. And I'm starting my third year as a tenure track professor of finance at my old alma mater, where my wife and I went to school for our undergrads. That's great. So go back to your single family investment days. Uh, how, how long did it take you to compile that portfolio and what was your exit strategy? Um, I, I don't, it took a couple years, right? It took a few years of trying to buy it back in, <clears throat> back in those days. I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a good balance sheet. I didn't have a lot of cash. And so I remember borrowing money off of credit cards. I remember borrowing money for my in-laws. Uh, I even had my grandma loan me money. And so back in then, it was just trying to scrape together the capital. And I spent money on stuff I shouldn't have. I didn't spend enough money on things I should have. Um, and so it was really just kind of a trial by fire. I learned a lot about sort of how valuation works. Um, I learned a lot about how um, you get able to sort of manage contracts, right? You sort of get to sink your teeth in and kind of you know, really earn your, earn your stripes in that market. And my, my, I didn't really have an exit valuation because at that point in time, all I knew was sort of with the dollars in and the dollars out math were. I knew how much rent I could bring in and how much it would cost me to acquire that property, renovate it, and then what my run rate was. So I wasn't really concerned about the value of the property because I knew I had such a great cash flowing asset. Um, and today it looked like a great idea. Like looking back, you see the nice dip in single family home housing prices and you think, oh, I wish I would have done more, right? But in the middle of that event, in the middle of that, uh, making those decisions, there weren't many people that agreed with me, right? Most people thought buying single family homes, it's a washed up asset, it's only gonna go down, it'll never appreciate. 
um, people only saw a risk. And, and so that in the middle of the opportunity rarely looks like an opportunity. Um, and so that's why I had to be very careful and diligent. And looking back now, I'm thankful for the decisions I made. But in the moment, it can be hard to see sort of where the value lies um, in those kinds of strategies. The single family homes, do you currently own them? Have you sold them off kind of piecemeal or, or you know, wh- where does that portfolio stand right now? I've unloaded all my single family homes. I, I have been trying to push forward towards larger, uh, larger professionally managed assets. And one of the things I've been trying to do to simplify my life and my investment portfolio is selling off smaller, smaller assets. So all my single family homes are gone. All my duplexes are gone. Um, I've been unwinding on my threeplexes and fourplexes. Um, I think maybe the smallest asset I have now might be, you know, 30 or 40 units and everything is bigger than that above that size. And the, again, the single family homes, uh, how many transactions did it take to liquidate that portfolio? Or is it, was it one big bulk transaction or kind of uh, in steps? Uh, in, in individual steps, right? It had to do with timing of in the, the, the loan terms at a timing of my, uh, when my tenants were rolling out. Um, but I was able to actually this last fall, I, one of my investors was able to unload about four dozen single family homes to a portfolio seller. And we were able to get him a big 1031 exchange. And now he went from owning four dozen single family homes to he's the sole investor in a 314 unit property in Memphis, Tennessee. So I do have some experience helping people exit large portfolios um, if they're ready to sort of, um, you know, not be their own, you know, let, let, let the money go to work for them instead of managing 41 tenants and managing 41 city inspectors, right? Unline, unwind that big position. Let's put it towards a larger asset, get some better leverage um, and really give some time back to their life. So that was a really great inv- opportunity for one of my investors this fall. Uh, and I was able to facilitate that through my uh, networking experience in those markets. What kind of advice or what kind of guidance were they seeking uh, from you? Was it the, was it the uh, asset management, the lease up? Was it the, just the, the overall exit strategy? Um, kind of what, what role did you serve in, in, uh, you know, uh, in those transactions? Yeah, I, I think the biggest value that I brought to the transaction is I bought credibility as a buyer. When you get into larger multifamily transactions, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, it's not about who can pay the most, right? It is not about who to pay the most. It's about who is the most likely to close. And so most of my transactions, I'm never the highest bidder, but I spend time developing relationships with the brokers to help them understand where my, where, that I am a credible, experienced buyer. I have property managers that work for me that help me provide insight. I've got lenders in my hand and I have investors ready to go. Uh, so my, I think the best value is I can bring to that transaction, not only the the uh, the credibility to get a seller comfortable with me as a buyer, but also I have a lot of experience executing large capital plans, making acquisitions and working with the kind of lenders that simply, even if you are very wealthy, they don't just hand out loans at that size. They want to make sure you have the experience, you have the liquidity uh, and you have all of the uh, financial components that they're comfortable deploying their capital into a leveraged asset like that. So let's talk about that uh, 2,200 unit uh, portfolio that you have currently. Um, is that a mix of, of uh, your position in the, in the uh, ownership structure? Is that, uh, are you a GP in some, LP in some? Uh, kind of walk me through your involvement in, in uh, that uh, multifamily portfolio. Yeah. So that 2,200 units represents um, either deals that I am a joint venture. I partner with other people to acquire. One of my main business partners and I, we just bought a building together. So that'd be like a joint venture deal. Um, the rest of the count of those would be components where I am a general partner. So I don't include any passive, just limited partnership investments. However, I am a limited partner on uh, pretty much every deal that I'm also a general partner on. So I do invest in my own deals along with my investors. And that's one of the stories I tell them. So that's, that's purely a, that, that number is purely a, a managing member number. I have additional investments in a few other passive activities, but that's, that's outside of that total. So let's talk about that, the story that you tell your, your passive investors. Uh, how important is the story uh, that's told to these passive investors that you and your, your other business partners are reaching out to with uh, why they want to deploy their capital into a project that you're sponsoring? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of reasons that we really can help articulate uh, the story about why they should invest. I think one really is we have very... Uh, thoughtful, uh, complete underwriting. And we can really build a full business case on, on both comps and rent per square foot. 
Um, we've got some very sophisticated underwriting models that we're able to communicate um, how we're able to identify that process. And not only how we're able to identify sort of where we think the intrinsic value of the property lies, but also where we think that there's upside. So we can help say, you know, our, our target for this assumption is here, but we know the market is up here. We think that we can have our expenses here, but we really know our run rate on a similar properties looks like here. So I think we're able to tell a really great story about um, the valuation. We can tell a really great story about our experience and similar properties that we've executed in the similar markets. And I think the third thing is we can tell really great stories about the partners that we uh, bring onto these deals, like our property managers or third-party construction managers that have executed really fantastic projects for us in the past, and that we have a lot of confidence that they can hit the kind of numbers, uh, both in terms of numbers and timing is a big component to how we are able to uh, create a lot of value really quickly and minimize the amount of risk to our investors. You're underwriting now versus your underwriting, call it, you know, a year ago has changed in what ways? Um, I think, well, there's a couple pieces. I think uh, from a year ago, um, we're not getting quite as good of leverage as we used to. I think uh, the, the, bridge, the bridge lenders used to throw a little bit more leverage at us than we used to have before. Um, some of our agency requirements um, have, means that we have to put a little bit more money sitting into escrow for some of our principal and interest. Uh, I think uh, on the top line basis, we have under, we've underwritten our rent escalation clauses pretty much flat for the next two, maybe three years. Uh, and we built in a little bit larger delinquency. So I think we put a bit more, we've sort of been forced to from the lending side, uh, but we've also been able to put some additional kind of levers into the underwriting that help us, under, help us limit what our upside is at the same time. Gotcha. Um, you are a, um, one of the, I would call it one of the architects uh, to um, uh, Michael Blonde, the Dealmaker Masterminds, uh, yeah. you know, um, SDA, the Syndicated Deal Analyzer, which is a, a tool that I use. Um, it's one yeah. of the most inclusive uh, financial models that I, I've ever used. Um, how has that evolved over the last year? Um, there, there have been some changes uh, with regards to Fannie Mae, Freddie Max, uh, reserve requirements at closing. Um, you know, so it seems like that that model is 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 changing all the time. Yeah. Um, walk the listeners through the you know those really important changes in terms of underwriting now versus underwriting you know pre coronavirus. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've been able to capture with that syndicated deal analyzer is a more holistic and complete um, valuation of the property at exit. Um, oftentimes, we just kind of took a, you took your NL, your last NOI number, you multiply, divided by a cap rate, and that was your exit. And the fact is, that's really not how syndications wind down. Uh, at the end of a syndication, you're going to have additional dollars that are sitting in an operating account because you're not going to spend all that working capital. You're still going to have cash that needs to be distributed. You're going to have money sitting, likely sitting in escrows or holding accounts for that principal and interest. So we've really been able to capture the disposition of the complete cash proceeds at the end to help give us a better picture of the value. Um, I think the second thing is, if you really get into how properties are valued at disposition, it is extraordinarily rare that you price a property at the end of its, you know, end of its last year divided by a cap rate. Um, if you were to close the books on 2019, on December 31st, and then you began to market your property, before you sold that property, you are going to be halfway through 2020, right? So you are likely going to have an improvement in your total NOI, your annualized NOI rate six months later. So we wanna make sure that we have a little, we've, we've discounted a couple of things and we provided a little juice to say, um, even if you'd owned a property that was built brand new, 10 years ago, there's probably some value add, right? There's probably gonna be a little bit of timing differences between a complete uh, uh, end of the year calculation and your marketing versus when you actually close. So we recognize that there's gonna be a little bit more meat on the bone. Um, I think the other thing that we've been able to do in the syndicated deal analyzer is really do a great job of blowing out some of the expense buckets uh, and help give us some, a better sense of how all the, the complete financials start to work on that. Um, it's, it's, it, it has been my experience looking at hundreds of SDAs that it is more likely people are going to miss their cash on cash return and are going to um, over, they're going to miss their cash on cash return, but they're going to exceed their IRR. And so we're really trying to put a lot of, we're trying to really build some of those components into the PL. And that's really just about providing visibility and having additional components related to acquisition costs, additional components related to ongoing expense management, and really putting some cushion in there for those cash impacts on replacement reserves. Uh, and that's going to, I think, really bring down the cash on cash 
but hopefully should provide some more better clarity and accuracy on the disposition to have a total return metric with an IRR. So we're really excited about some of the pieces that have, have come along and some of the adjustments we've made. Um, it's certainly not the most complex tool, but we want it to be one that is uh, the most widely used, user-friendly, um, accurate tool out there, uh, that if someone is really going after a property you know, for their first multifamily syndication and the sub $5 million range, there's no better tool than this. It's easiest to learn, easiest to manage, easiest to modify. Above $5 million, the syndicated deal analyzer doesn't flex great. Right? You're going to need to make some additional adjustments. And of course, if you're doing a deal larger than $5 million, you better have some great partners on board who know how to work, work that model, um, like some of the mentors that we have in the Michael Blunt program. Um, so that's, that's really kind of where the target for that model is and, and what are some of the things that we've done. Uh, for investors out there that are underwriting deals based on the you know, the, the OM, the offering memory and memorandum that's presented to them by brokers, uh, you know, the income versus expenses. I, I think it's a little bit easier to, uh, to look at a rent roll and, uh, you know, pro forma of where rents could go, where they currently are. You can do a lot of research online, but I think a few things in the expense column throw throw folks off, um, you know, th- things that, um, you know, taxes, um, insurance that on a, you know, a T12 may, may not be reflective of what they will, uh, they'll see in the future upon their acquisition. Um, what, are, what are some things in the expense column that uh, for you and your underwriting experience uh, that you really have to keep an eye on um, versus, you know, now versus, you know, down the road, um, you know, uh, upon an acquisition? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that is very often now when you see properties that are marketed, um, you can have properties that are financially groomed to sell for the year or two beforehand, right? And so that can look like if you're running a portfolio, the property manager may not be allocating expenses uh, quite as precisely as maybe they should be. Um, I've been in situations where I've looked at financials and um, I've realized that some of the repairs have been sitting off on a different financial statement because the owner ran their own construction company. So you end up with this property that looks like it's operating a bit more efficiently than it probably has. Uh, and there's not, it's a hard to catch that, right? It's hard to really audit that. Um, but so you really need to have a good property manager to help you overlay what your new expense structure is going to be. Uh, and, and frankly, Nick, when you get a PL from a broker, I really don't believe much of it. Like I like to verify the top line. But if you're buying a multifamily asset today, you're going to have to do some value add. And that usually means overlaying your own expense structure. It means you put in your own uh, insurance requirements. You put in your own uh, property tax forecast estimates. Um, You put on your own payroll and management and maintenance, right? We're not looking to have a job here. We're looking to be investors. Um, So frankly, outside of like contract services, pretty much everything else you need to sort of build and verify. So I don't put a lot of stock in those. Uh, in those reports, either from either from historical perspectives or forecasting perspectives. And some of them are pretty and some of them look great and they've got nice color schemes and beautiful graphs. But I'm telling you, those are not good information to build a business case off of. It's it's certainly important to to go beyond the, you know, the pretty PDF that's being sent to you. Um, yes. You know, listen, the, I'm, a, I'm a real estate broker. It's all about, you know, the romance and the presentation. Um, but you, you also, as an investor, you have to, you, you have to do your own homework uh, because the, the broker's job that's representing the, the seller of a property, their job is to get the highest possible dollar amount uh, with, from the, the, you know, that one buyer that, that they think and feel is going to be able to transact per your, you know, your, uh, your point earlier. Um, so it's really, it's really important for a buyer to, you know, to, to look past the, you know, the, the pretty little package, uh, yes. that is, is being sent to them in their inbox. Yeah. Um, you know, is that correct? It is. And I think if you're only buying deals with beautiful little packages, you're probably paying too much, right? This, 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 Business is based on relationships and reputation. The best deals I've ever gone have ever done in my career don't have any operating memorandums. They're, they're people that give me a call and say, look, we got to unload this. We need a buyer. We need the speed. We need the price. We need something, right? We need to solve a problem. And there's no OM. And they send me a handwritten rent roll, right? I don't want to, that's, that's where the juice is. Like that is where the opportunity is when you're not competing against a broad, broad group of people for a nice polished 
smooth running asset. I want a property that has a problem to solve. I want a property that has an expense problem, a collections problem, has a property management problem. I have want to solve a problem for an owner that needs to exit for whatever liquidity reasons. Like those are the deals where you end up making the best money. That and that's where you can provide the greatest value to the investors is not simply being the guy that gets an email along with a hundred other people uh, to look at a property, but the one that knows the brokers and knows the market uh, that people can come to you and say, Hey, we've got a problem to solve here. Uh, we don't have any marketing materials, but we want you to take a look at this. And this is where, this is the advantage that I have in some of these markets that I play in because of the reputation that I have developed and that I, I, I am on, I have a, a good, I, I can, um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I end up with the uh, the chance to sort of speak with a lot of these brokers on a one-on-one basis and have built a relationship with them in order to know that they'll take my call. When I call, they'll pick up. And when they need something done from the buyer standpoint, they know that they can rely on me. Let's talk about, uh, you know, you are a, an educator. You have some uh, investment uh, students, if you will. Um, what is the biggest opportunity for somebody looking for their first, second, third deal um, in this market. Secondly, what is the biggest barrier to these uh, younger, less experienced investors? What's their, what's the biggest barrier to entry in a market like this? Sure. I, I think the number one barrier for people is that they try to do all of the responsibilities associated with doing multifamily syndication, right? They, they say, well, I want to de- 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 develop broker relationships. I want to develop investor relationships. I want to work on the real analytics of the property to get the valuation. I want to work on doing the capital, the capital uh, executing the capital plan or working with the property manager, right? So um, I think that people who really try to do all of this at one time, especially new into the market, are less likely to succeed than those who have been able to uh, find people with similar or complementary interests. And by similar, I mean either geographic locations or asset types, or by complementary, I mean someone's really good at doing underwriting or someone's really good at networking with investors or brokers, or someone's really good on the construction side so they can have a really great sense of how to underwrite capital plans. Uh, And so the most successful people I've seen that get into this business are able to partner up with like-minded people that they want to do deals with. Um, The second thing I think is really and probably just as important are people that are well-capitalized um, in order to move quickly in this market. Um, I, I think this is a great business to get into. I think that there is uh, some misnomers that it's easy to get into a syndication with no money. I think if you have a lot of money, you can do it with no money. But if you don't have any money, it's really hard to. It's a very difficult job because you need to move quick with your good faith deposits and your, and your, and your earnest money. You want to be able to negotiate. Um, just, just recently, I negotiated a deal where I doubled my earnest money in order to get a nice price break. Uh, but I was only able to do that because myself and my partners were capitalized well in order to make that upfront capital commitment to move quickly. Um, so having the capital, having the partners, I think really is going to be the key to being able to get some of those good deals done that builds a reputation that allows you to get to deals four, five, and six. We're going to conclude this episode, Drew, with the hard-hitting questions. These are the questions that we ask at every one of our listeners. Uh, first question I always ask is, what is your why? Um, my why is that uh, early on in my career, I was uh, let go from uh, my, I was laid off twice in one year. And I woke up one day and said, I am no longer going to be beholden to any corporate entity to provide for myself and my family and our future. And so I, I started on this process to say, I need to find an opportunity to create wealth and passive income. So I no longer have to be responsible. It's, it's not my company's job to provide for me. It's not the government's job. It's not my family's job. I want to be the only one responsible for me. And so that's what got me up in the morning. That created that sense of independence. Uh, and that is really what has driven me to have the, the freedom that I get to do and enjoy today to do things that I feel are both valuable and meaningful and interesting. Besides your alarm clock, what gets you out of bed every morning? You know, it's, it's our four kids. We've got four kids, ages 11 through five. Uh, just, a, just a handful, just a, a ton of... A ton of uh, energy and, and a lot of work parenting. Um, it's very exciting. I, I've enjoyed the summer. We've had, I had the summer off because I'm an educator. I had the summer off. So we spent a lot of time uh, driving around with four kids and a dog in a minivan. We're going to grandma's. We're going to the lake. Um, really had just a great opportunity to spend some great family time together. <clears throat> have, you read a, have you read a book recently that has provided significant value to your career or your life? Yeah. So there's a book called Progress 
by a Norwegian economist named Johan Norberg. Um, he uh, set out this book to write that uh, really looks at a bunch of different metrics across the human condition um, that have changed over the last 200 years and especially over the last 40. If you look at violence and poverty and healthcare and pollution, nearly every life expectancy, nearly every metric of the human condition has improved dramatically over the last 200 years and especially over the last 30 or 40. Uh, and it's not a topic. Everyone sort of has a, uh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but this, proved, this book proves with clear statistics and logical thinking that we are living in the golden age. And, and every metric of the human condition and experience is better today than it ever has been, even 20 or 30 years ago. And so it has provided a great lens for how I view the world, the gratefulness that I have in my life. Um, and it's even a book that I make some of my students read uh, at my university because I want them to have that same perspective and be able to take that, that optimism and that gratefulness out into the world after they graduate. Drew, what is one piece of advice, knowing what you know now, what is one piece of advice that you would give your 21, 22-year-old college graduate self? Yeah, don't be scared to work for yourself. Don't be scared to go out and find your place in this world. Take some risks. Right? If, 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 if what has been modeled for you in your life uh, has been a parent that has gone to work and retired after 40 years, uh, that's not a model everyone has to follow. Uh, find ways to create opportunities in your life uh, to, to be your own boss, own assets, own assets. Uh, don't just own it. Worry about your balance sheet. Don't just worry about your income statement. That's the one. Worry about your balance sheet, not just your income statement. And that will lead you to making decisions with your life that will allow you to, to do the kind of things you want down the road. Drew, how can our listeners learn a little bit more about you or get a hold of you? Sure. Um, my email is drew.witson. W-H-I-T-S-O-N at gmail.com. You're welcome to find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'd be happy to connect with you. That's great. Drew, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for, for dealing with my multiple res reschedulings this past summer. Um, and uh, so grateful for your time and adding your value today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave a rating and a review, which will help us introduce the podcast to other listeners. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which will give you access to other episodes you may have missed. Lastly, if you'd like to learn more about investing alongside us, then head on over to valueaddedpodcast.com. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you next week.